The History of King Lear by Naam Tate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae. King Lear. Read by Bob Gonzalez. Gloucester. Read by Martin Geeson. Kent. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Edgar. Read by Dublin Gothic. Edmund the Bastard. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Cornwall. Read by David Goldfarb. Cornwall's Servant, Old Man and Gentleman. Read by Algie Pug. Albany. Read by Noel Badrian. Burgundy and Physician. Read by James Curtis. Goneril's Gentleman Usher. Read by Christine G. Attendant and Messenger. Read by C. Jacob A. Arante, Cordelia's Attendant, and Herald. Read by Tiffany Halla Colonna. Attendant. Read by Phil Chenevere. First Ruffian and Officer. Read by Nathaniel W. C. Higgins. Second Ruffian and Captain. Read by Robert Hoffman. Goneril. Read by Bev Stevens. Regan. Read by Liberty Stump. Cordelia. Read by Miss Avarice. Narrator. Read by Algie Pug. Introduction and Prologue to the History of King Lear by Nahum Tate. Read by Martin Geeson. Epistle dedicatory to my esteemed friend Thomas Butler, Esquire. Sir, you have a natural right to this piece since by your advice i attempted the revival of it with alterations nothing but the power of your persuasion and my zeal for all the remains of shakespeare could have wrought me to so bold an undertaking i found that the new modelling of this story would force me sometimes on the difficult task of making the chiefest persons speak something like their character on matter whereon i had no ground in my author lear's real and edgar's pretended madness have so much of extravagant nature i know not how else to express it as could never have started but from our shakespeare's creating fancy the images and language are so odd and surprising and yet so agreeable and proper that whilst we grant that none but shakespeare could have formed such conceptions yet we are satisfied that they were the only things in the world that ought to be said on those occasions i found the whole to answer your account of it a heap of jewels unstrung and unpolished yet so dazzling in their disorder that i soon perceived i had seized a treasure twas my good fortune to light on one expedient to rectify what was wanting in the regularity and probability of the tale which was to run through the whole a love betwixt edgar and cordelia that never changed word with each other in the original this renders cordelia's indifference and her father's passion in the first scene probable it likewise gives countenance to edgar's disguise making that a generous design that was before a poor shift to save his life the distress of the story is evidently heightened by it and it particularly gave occasion of a new scene or two of more success perhaps than merit this method necessarily threw me on making the tale conclude in a success to the innocent distressed persons otherwise i must have encumbered the stage with dead bodies 
which conduct makes many tragedies conclude with unseasonable jests yet i was racked with no small fears for so bold a change till i found it well received by my audience and if this will not satisfy the reader i can produce an authority that questionless will marginal note mr dryden preface to the spanish friar neither is it of so trivial an undertaking to make a tragedy end happily what is more difficult to save than tis to kill the dagger and cup of poison are always in readiness but to bring the action to the last extremity and then by probable means to recover all will require the art and judgment of a writer and cost him many a pang in the performance i have one thing more to apologize for which is that i have used less quaintness of expression even in the newest parts of this play i confess twas design in me partly to comply with my author's style to make the scenes of a piece and partly to give it some resemblance of the time and persons here represented this sir i submit wholly to you who are both a judge and master of style nature had exempted you before you went abroad from the morose saturnine humour of our country and you brought home the refinedness of travel without the affectation many faults i see in the following pages and question not but you will discover more yet i will presume so far on your friendship as to make the whole a present to you and subscribe myself your obliged friend and humble servant n tate prologue ha since by mistakes your best delights are made for even your wives can please in masquerade twere worth our while to have drawn you in this day by a new name to our old honest play but he that did this evening's treat prepare bluntly resolved beforehand to declare your entertainment should be most old fair yet hopes since in rich shakespeare's soil it grew to relish yet with those whose tastes are true and his ambition is to please a few if then this heap of flowers should chance to wear fresh beauty in the order they now bear even this shakespeare's praise each rustic knows mongst plenteous flowers a garland to compose which strung by his coarse hand may fairer show but twas a power divine first made em grow why should these scenes lie hid in which we find what may at once divert and teach the mind morals were always proper for the stage but are even necessary in this age poets must take the church's teaching trade since priests their province of intrigue invade but we the worst in this exchange have got in vain our poets preach oh, whilst churchmen plot Act One. Scene One. Enter bastard Solus. Thou, nature, art my goddess. To thy law my services abound. Why am I then deprived of a son's right because I came not in the dull road that custom has prescribed? Why, bastard? Wherefore, base? when I can boast a mind as generous and a shape as true as honest madam's issue. Why are we held base, 
who in the lusty stealth of nature take fiercer qualities than what compound the scanted births of the stale marriage-bed. Well, then, legitimate Edgar, to thy right of law I will oppose a bastard's cunning. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to legitimate Edgar. With success I have practised yet on both their easy natures. Here comes the old man chaffed with the information which last I forged against my brother Edgar, a tale so plausible, so boldly uttered, and heightened by such lucky accidents, that now the slightest circumstance confirms him, and base-born Edmund spite of law inherits. Enter Kent and Gloucester. Nay, good my lord, your charity or shoots itself to plead in his behalf. You are yourself a father, and may feel the sting of disobedience from a son, first born and best beloved. Oh, villain Edgar! Be not too rash. All may be forgery, and time yet clear the duty of your son plead with the seas and reason down the winds yet shalt thou ne'er convince me i have seen his foul designs through all a father's fondness but be this light and thou my witnesses that i discard him here from my possessions divorce him from my heart my blood and name it works as i could wish i'll show myself oh edmund welcome boy oh kent see here inverted nature gloucester's shame and glory this bye-born the wild sally of my youth pursues me with all filial offices whilst edgar begged of heaven and born in honour draws plagues on my white head that urge me still to curse in age the pleasure of my youth nay weep not edmund for thy brother's crimes o oh, generous boy thou shar'st but half his blood yet lovest beyond the kindness of a brother but i'll reward thy virtue follow me my lord you wait the king who comes resolved to quit the toils of empire and divide his realms amongst his daughters heaven succeed it but much i fear the change i grieve to see him with such wild starts of passion hourly seized as renders majesty beneath itself alas tis the infirmity of his age yet has his temper ever been unfixed choleric and sudden hark they approach exeunt gloucester and a bastard scene two flourish enter lear cornwall albany burgundy edgar goneril regan cordelia edgar speaking to cordelia at entrance cordelia royal fair turn yet once more and ere successful burgundy receive the treasure of thy beauties from the king ere happy burgundy for ever fold thee cast back one pitying look on wretched edgar alas what would the wretched edgar with the more unfortunate cordelia who in obedience to a father's will flies from her edgar's arms to burgundy's attend my lords of albany and cornwall with princely burgundy we do my liege give me the map no lords we have divided in three our kingdom having now resolved to disengage from our long toil of state conferring all upon your younger years you burgundy cornwall and albany long in our court have made your amorous sojourn and now are to be answered tell me my daughters which of you loves us most that we may place our largest bounty with the largest merit goneril our eldest born speak first sir i do love you more than words can utter beyond what can be valued rich or rare 
nor liberty nor sight health fame or beauty are half so dear my life for you were vile as much as child can love the best of fathers of all these bounds e'en from this line to this with shady forests and wide skirted meads we make thee lady to thine and albany's issue be this perpetual what says our second daughter my sister sir in part expressed my love for such as hers is mine though more extended sense has no other joy than i can relish i have my all in my dear liege's love therefore to thee and thine hereditary remain this ample third of our fair kingdom aside now comes my trial how am i distressed that must with cold speech tempt the choleric king rather to leave me dowerless than condemn me to loathed embraces speak now our last not least in our dear love so ends my task of state cordelia speak what canst thou say to win a richer third than what thy sisters gained now must my love in words fall short of theirs as much as it exceeds in truth nothing my lord <laughs> nothing can come of nothing speak again unhappy i am that i can't dissemble sir as i ought i love your majesty no more nor less take heed cordelia thy fortunes are at stake think better aunt and mend thy speech a little o oh, my liege you gave me being bred me dearly loved me and i return my duty as i ought obey you love you and most honour you why have my sisters husbands if they love you all haply when i shall wed the lord whose hand shall take my plight will carry half my love for i shall never marry like my sisters to love my father all and goes thy heart with this tis said that i am choleric judge me gods is there not cause now minion i perceive the truth of what has been suggested to us thy fondness for the rebel son of gloucester false to his father as thou art to my hopes and oh take heed rash girl lest we comply with thy fond wishes which thou wilt too late repent for know our nature cannot brook a child so young and so ungentle so young my lord and true thy truth then be thy dower for by the sacred sun and solemn night i here disclaim all my paternal care and from this minute hold thee as a stranger both to my blood and favour this is frenzy consider good my liege peace kent come not between a dragon and his rage i loved her most and in her tender trust designed to have bestowed my age at ease so be my grave my peace as here i give my heart from her and with it all my wealth my lords of cornwall and of albany i do invest you jointly with full right in this fair third cordelia's forfeit dower mark me my lords observe our last resolve ourself attended with an hundred knights will make abroad with you in monthly course the name alone of king remain with me yours be the execution and revenues this is our final will and to confirm it this coronet part between you royal lear whom i have ever honoured as my king loved as my father as my master followed and as my patron thought on in my prayers away the bow is bent make from the shaft no let it fall and drench within my heart be kent unmannerly when lear is mad thy youngest daughter on thy life no more 
What wilt thou do, old man? Out of my sight. See better first. Now by the gods. Now by the gods, rash king, thou swearest in vain. Ha! Ah, traitor! Do kill thy physician, Lear. Strike through my throat. Yet with my latest breath I'll thunder in thine ear my just complaint, and tell thee to thy face that thou dost ill. Hear me, rash man, on thy allegiance, hear me. Since thou hast striven to make us break our vow, and pressed between our sentence and our power, which nor our nature nor our place can bear, we banish thee for ever from our sight and kingdom. If when three days are expired, thy hated trunk be found in our dominions, that moment is thy death. Away! Why fare thee well, king? Since thou art resolved, I take thee at thy word, and will not stay to see thy fall. The gods protect the maid that truly thinks and has most justly said. Thus to new climates my old truth I bear. Friendship lives hence, and banishment is here. Exit. Now, Burgundy, you see her price is fallen, yet if the fondness of your passion still affects her as she stands, dowerless and lost in our esteem, she's yours. Take her or leave her. Pardon me, royal Lear, I but demand the dower yourself proposed. And here I take Cordelia by the hand, Duchess of Burgundy. Then leave her, sir, for by a father's rage I tell you all her wealth. Away! Then, sir, be pleased to charge the breach of our alliance on your own will, not my inconstancy. Exeunt. Manent Edgar and Cordelia. Has heaven then weighed the merit of my love, or is the raving of my sickly thought? Could Burgundy forgo so rich a prize, and leave her to despairing Edgar's arms? Have I thy hand, Cordelia? Do I clasp it? The hand that was this minute to have joined my hated rivals? Do I kneel before thee, and offer at thy feet my panting heart? Smile, princess, and convince me, for as yet I doubt, and dare not trust the dazzling joy. Some comfort yet that twas no vicious blot, that has deprived me of a father's grace, but merely want of that that makes me rich, in wanting it, a smooth professing tongue. O oh, sisters, I am loth to call your fault, as it deserves, but use our father well, and wrong Cordelia never shall repine. O oh, heavenly maiden, that art thyself thy dower, richer in virtue than the stars in light. If Edgar's humble fortunes may be graced with thy acceptance, at thy feet he lays them. Ah, my Cordelia, dost thou turn away? What have I done to offend thee? Talked of love. Then I've offended oft. Cordelia, too, has oft permitted me so to offend. When, Edgar, I permitted your addresses, I was the darling daughter of a king. Nor can I now forget my royal birth, and live dependent on my lover's fortune. I cannot to so low a fate submit, and therefore study to forget your passion, and trouble me upon this theme no more. Thus majesty takes most state in distress. How are we tossed on fortune's fickle flood? The wave that with surprising kindness brought the dear wreck to my arms has snatched it back and left me mourning on the barren shore. Aside this baseness of the ignoble burgundy draws just suspicion on the race of men his love was interest so may edgar's be and he but with more compliment dissemble if so i shall oblige him by denying but if his love be fixed such constant flame as warms our breasts if such i find his passion my heart as grateful to his truth shall be and cold cordelia prove as kind as he Exit. Enter Bastard hastily. Brother, I found you in a lucky minute. Fly and be safe. Some villain has incensed our father against your life. Distressed Cordelia. But, oh, more cruel. 
Hear me, sir, your life, your life's in danger. A resolve so sudden, and of such black importance. T'was not sudden. Some villain has of long time laid the train. And yet perhaps t'was but pretended coldness, to try how far my passion would pursue. He hears me not. Wake, wake, sir. Say ye, brother, no tears, good Edmund. If thou bring'st me tidings to strike me dead, for charity delay not, that present will befit so kind a hand. Your danger, sir, comes on so fast that I want time to inform you. But retire whilst I take care to turn the pressing stream. Oh, gods, for heaven's sake, sir! Pardon me, sir. A serious thought had seized me. But I think you talked of danger and wished me to retire. Must all our vows end thus? Friend, I obey you. O oh, Cordelia! Exit. Ha! <laughs> Fond man! Such credulous honesty lessens the glory of my artifice. His nature is so far from doing wrongs that he suspects none. If this letter speed and pass for Edgar's, as himself would own the counterfeit but for the foul contents, then my designs are perfect. Here comes Gloucester. Enter Gloucester. Stay, Edmund. Turn. What paper were you reading? A trifle, sir. What needed, then, that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? Come, produce it, sir. A letter from my brother, sir. I had just broke the seal, but knew not the contents. Yet, fearing they might prove to blame, endeavoured to conceal it from your sight. Tis Edgar's character. Reads. This policy of father's is intolerable that keeps our fortunes from us till age will not suffer us to enjoy em i am weary of the tyranny come to me that of this i may speak more if our father would sleep till i waked him you should enjoy half his possessions and live beloved of your brother edgar slept till i wake him you should enjoy half his possessions. Edgar to write this, against his indulgent father. Death and hell! Fly, Edmund, seek him out. Wind me into him, that I may bite the traitor's heart, and fold his bleeding entrails on my vengeful arm. Perhaps t'was writ, my lord, to prove my virtue. Oh, these late eclipses of the sun and moon can bode no less love cools and friendship fails in cities mutiny in countries discord the bond of nature cracked twixt son and father find out the villain do it carefully and it shall lose thee nothing oh. exit so now my project's firm. But to make sure, I'll throw in one proof more, and that a bold one. I'll place old Gloucester, where he shall o'erhear us, confer of this design, whilst to his thinking deluded Edgar shall accuse himself. Be honesty my interest, and I can be honest too, and what saint so divine that will successful villainy decline? Exit. Scene three. Enter Kent disguised now banished kent if thou canst pay thy duty in this disguise where thou dost stand condemned thy master lear shall find thee full of labours enter lear attended in there and tell our daughter we are here now what art thou a man sir what dost thou profess or wouldst with us I do profess to be no less than I seem, to serve him truly that puts me in trust, to love him that's honest, to converse with him that's wise and speaks little, to fight when I can't choose, and to eat no fish. I say, what art thou? A very honest-hearted fellow, and as poor as the king. Then art thou poor indeed. What canst thou do? I can keep honest counsel, mar a curious tale in the telling, Deliver a plain message bluntly, 
that which ordinary men are fit for I am qualified in, and the best of me is diligence. Follow me. Thou shalt serve me. Enter one of Goneril's gentlemen. Now, sir? Sir. Exit. Kent runs after him. What says the fellow? Call the clatpole back. My lord, I know not, but methinks your highness is entertained with slender ceremony. Who says, my lord, your daughter is not well? Why came not the slave back when I called him? My lord, he answered me in the surliest manner that he would not. Re-enter gentleman brought in by Kent. I hope our daughter did not so instruct him. Now, who am I, sir? My lady's father. My lord's knave! Strikes him. Goneril at the entrance. I'll not be struck, my lord. Nor tripped neither, thou vile civet box. Strikes up his heels. By day and night this is insufferable. I will not bear it. Now, daughter, why that frontlet on? Speak. Does that frown become our presence? Sir, this licentious insolence of your servants is most unseemly. Hourly they break out in quarrels bred by their unbounded riots. I had fair hope, by making this known to you, to have had a quick redress, but find too late that you protect and countenance their outrage. And therefore, sir, I take this freedom, which necessity makes discreet. Are you our daughter? Come, sir, let me entreat you to make use of your discretion, and put off betimes this disposition that of late transforms you from what you rightly are. Does any here know me? Why, this is not Lear. Does Lear walk thus, speak thus? Where are his eyes? Who is it that can tell me who I am? Come, sir. This admiration's much o' the savour of other your new humours. I beseech you to understand my purposes aright. As you are old, you should be staid and wise. Here do you keep an hundred knights and squires, men so debauched and bold that this our palace shows like a riotous inn, a tavern, brothel. Be then advised by her that else will take that which she begs, to lessen your attendance. Take half away, and see that the remainder be such as may befit your age, and know themselves and you. Darkness and devils! Saddle my horses, call my train together. Degenerate viper, I'll not stay with thee. I yet have left a daughter. Serpent! Monster! Lessen my train, and call em riotous! All men approved of choice and rarest parts that each particular of duty know. How small, Cordelia, was thy fault! O oh, Lear, beat at this gate that let thy folly in, and thy dear judgment out. Go, go, my people. Going off, meets Albany entering. Ingrateful Duke. Was this your will? What, sir? Death! Fifty of my followers at a clap! The matter, madam? Never afflict yourself to know the cause, but give his dotage way. Blasts upon thee! The untempted woundings of a father's curse pierce every sense about thee. Old fond eyes, lament this cause again, I'll pluck ye out, and cast ye with the waters that ye lose to temper clay. No, Gorgon, thou shalt find that I'll resume the shape which thou dost think I have cast off for ever. Mark ye that. Hear, nature, dear goddess, hear. And if thou dost intend to make that creature fruitful, change thy purpose. Pronounce upon her womb the barren curse, that from her blasted body never spring a babe to honour her. But if she must bring forth, 
defeat her joy with some distorted birth or monstrous form the prodigy of the time and so perverse of spirit that it may live her torment as twas born to fret her cheeks with constant tears and wrinkle her young brow turn all her mother's pains to shame and scorn that she may curse her crime too late and feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child away away exit cum suis presuming thus upon his numerous train he thinks to play the tyrant here and hold our lives at will well you may bear too far exit end of the first act Act Two of the History of King Lear by Nahum Tate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two Scene Gloucester's House. Scene One Enter Bastard. The Duke comes here to night. I'll take advantage of his arrival to complete my project. Brother, a word. Come forth. Tis I, your friend. Enter Edgar. My father watches for you. Fly this place. Intelligence is given where you are hid. Take the advantage of the night. Bethink ye have not spoke against the Duke of Cornwall something that might show you a favour of Duke Albany's party. Nothing. Why ask you? Because he's coming here to-night, in haste, and Regan with him. Hark! The guards! away let them come on i'll stay and clear myself your innocence at leisure may be heard but gloucester's storming rage as yet is deaf and you may perish ere allowed the hearing exit edgar gloucester comes yonder now to my feigned scuffle yield come before my father lights here lights some blood drawn on me would beget opinion stabs his arm of our more fierce encounter. I have seen drunkards do more than this in sport. Enter Gloucester and servants. Now, Edmund, where's the traitor? Oh, that name, sir, strikes horror through me. But my brother, sir, stood here in the dark. Thou bleedst. Pursue the villain and bring him piecemeal to me. Sir, he's fled. Let him fly far. This kingdom shall not hide him. The noble duke, my patron, comes to-night. By his authority I will proclaim rewards for him that brings him to the stake, and death for the concealer. Then of my lands, loyal and natural boy, I'll work the means to make thee capable. Exeunt. Scene two. Enter Kent, disguised still, and Goneril's gentleman severally. Good morrow, friend. Belongst thou to this house? Ask them will answer thee. Where may we set our horses? I the mire. I am in haste. Prithee and thou lovest me, tell me. I love thee not. Why then I care not for thee? An I had thee in Lipsbury pinfold, I'd make thee care for me. What dost thou mean? I know thee not. But, minion, I know thee. What dost thou know me for? For a base, proud, beggarly, white-livered, glass-gazing, superserviceable, finical rogue, one that would be a pimp in way of good service, and art nothing but a composition of knave, beggar, coward, pander. What a monstrous fellow art thou, to rail at one that is neither known of thee, nor knows thee impudent slave not know me who but two days since tripped up thy heels before the king draw miscreant or i'll make the moon shine through thee what means the fellow why prithee prithee i tell thee i have nothing to do with thee i know your rogueship's office you come with letters against the king taking my young lady vanity's part against her royal father draw rascal mirtha mirtha help ho Dost thou scream, peacock? Strike, puppet! Stand dapper, slave! Help he! 
Murtha, help! Exit, Kent after him. Scene three. Flourish. Enter Duke of Cornwall, Regan, attended, Gloucester, bastard. All welcome to your graces. You do me honour. Gloucester, who have heard with sorrow that your life has been attempted by your impious son, but Edmund here has paid you strictest duty. He did betray his practice, and received the hurt you see, striving to apprehend him. Is he pursued? He is, my lord. Use our authority to apprehend the traitor, and do justice on his head. For you, Edmund, that have so signalized your virtue, you from henceforth shall be ours. Natures of such firm trust we much shall need. Aside. A charming youth, and worth my further thought. Lay comforts, noble Gloucester, to your breast, as we to ours. This night be spent in revels. We choose you, Gloucester, for our host to-night. A troublesome expression of our love. On to the sports before us. Who are these? Enter the gentleman pursued by Kent. Now, what's the matter? Keep peace. Upon your lives he dies that strikes. Whence and what are ye? Sir, they are messengers, the one from your sister, the other from the king. Your difference. Speak. I am scarce in breath, my lord. No marvel. You have so bestirred your valour. Nature disclaims the dastard. A tailor made him. Speak yet. How grew your quarrel? Sir, this old ruffian here, whose life I spared in pity to his bed. Thou essence bottle, in pity to my beard. Your leave, my lord, and I will tread the muscat into mortar. Know'st thou our presence? Yes, sir, but anger has a privilege. Why art thou angry? That such a slave as this should wear a sword and have no courage, office, and no honesty. Not frost and fire hold more antipathy than I and such a knave. Why dost thou call him knave? His countenance likes me not. No more, perhaps, does mine, nor his or hers. Plain dealing is my trade, and to be plain, sir, I have seen better faces in my time than stands on any shoulders now before me. This is some fellow that, having once been praised for bluntness, sense affects a saucy rudeness. But I have known one of these surly knaves that in his plainness harboured more design than twenty cringing, complimenting minions. What's the offence you gave him? Never any, sir. It pleased the king his mastery lately to strike me on a slender misconstruction. Whilst watching his advantage, this old lurcher tripped me behind, for which the king extolled him, and flushed with the honour of this bold exploit, drew on me here again. Bring forth the stocks. We'll teach you. Sir, I'm too old to learn. Call not the stocks for me. I serve the king on whose employment I was sent to you. You'll show too small respect and too bold malice against the person of my royal master, stalking his messenger. Bring forth the stocks. As I have life and honour, there shall he sit till noon. Till noon, my lord. Till night. And all night, too. Why, madam, if I were your father's dog, you would not use me so. Sir, being his knave, I will. Let me beseech your graces to forbear him. His fault is much, and the good king, his master, will check him for it. But needs must take it ill to be thus slighted in his messenger. We'll answer that. Our sister may receive it worse to have her gentleman assaulted. To our business lead. Exit. I am sorry for thee, friend. Tis the Duke's pleasure, whose disposition will not be controlled. But I'll entreat for thee. Pray, do not, sir. I have watched and travelled hard. Some time I shall sleep out. The rest... I'll whistle. Farewell to you, sir. Exit Gloucester. All weary and o'er-watched, I feel the drowsy guest steal on me. Take advantage, heavy eyes, of this kind slumber. 
not to behold this vile and shameful lodging. Sleeps. Scene four. Enter Edgar. I heard myself proclaimed, and by the friendly hollow of a tree escaped the hunt. No port is free, no place where guards and most unusual vigilance do not attend to take me. How easy now twere to defeat the malice of my trail, and leave my griefs on my sword's reeking point. But love detains me from death's peaceful cell, still whispering me Cordelia's in distress. Unkind as she is, I cannot see her wretched, but must be near to wait upon her fortune. Who knows but the white minute yet may come when Edgar may do service to Cordelia. That charming hope still ties me to the oar of painful life, and makes me too submit to the humblest shifts to keep that life afoot. My face I will be smear, and knit my locks. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars, who with roaring voices strike in their numbed and mortified bare arms, pins, iron spikes, thorns, sprigs of rosemary, and thus from sheepcoats, villages and mills, sometimes with prayers, sometimes with lunatic bands, enforce their charity. Poor Turleygod, poor Tom, that's something yet. Edgar, I am no more. Exit. Scene five. Kent in the stocks still. Enter Lear attended. Tis strange that they should so depart from home and not send back our messenger. Hail, noble master. How? Makes thou this shame thy pastime? What's he that has so much mistook thy place to set thee here? It is both he and she, sir, your son and daughter. No. Yes. No, I say. I say yea. By Jupiter, I swear no. By Juno, I swear, I swear I. They durst not do't, they could not, would not do't. Tis worse than murder to do upon respect such violent outrage. Resolve me with all modest haste which way thou mayst deserve, or they impose this usage. My lord, when at their home I did commend your highness letters to them, ere I was risen, arrived another post, steered in his haste, breathless and panting forth from Goneril his mistress' salutations, whose message being delivered they took horse, commending me to follow and attend the leisure of their answer, which I did, but meeting that other messenger, whose welcome I perceived had poisoned mine, being the very fellow that of late had shown such rudeness to your highness, I, having more man than wit about me, drew, on which he raised the house with coward cries. This was the trespass which your son and daughter thought worth the shame you see it suffer here. Oh, how this spleen swells upward to my heart, and heaves for passage! Down, thou climbing rage, thy elements below! Where is this daughter? Within, sir, at a mask. Enter Gloucester. Now, Gloucester? Ha! Deny to speak with me. They are sick, they are weary, they have travelled hard to-night. Mere fetches, bring me a better answer. My dear lord, you know the fiery quality of the duke. Vengeance! Death, plague, confusion! Fiery? What quality? Why, Gloucester, Gloucester, I'd speak with the Duke of Cornwall and his wife. I have informed em so. Informed em? Dost thou understand me, man? I tell thee, Gloucester. Ay, my good lord. The king would speak with Cornwall. The dear father would with his daughter speak, commands her service. Are they informed of this? My breath and blood, fiery, the fiery duke. Tell the hot duke. No, but not yet. Maybe he is not well. Infirmity does still neglect all office. I beg his pardon, and I'll chide my rashness that took the indisposed and sickly fit for the sound man. But wherefore sits he there? Death on my state, this act convinces me that this retiredness of the duke and her is plain contempt. Give me my servant forth, 
Go tell the duke and's wife I'd speak with them. Now, instantly, bid em come forth and hear me, or at their chamber door I'll beat the drum till it cry sleep to death. Enter Cornwall and Regan. Oh, are ye come? Health to the king. I am glad to see your highness. Regan, I think you are. I know what cause I have to think so. Shouldst thou not be glad, I would divorce me from thy mother's tomb. Beloved Regan, thou wilt shake to hear what I shall utter. Thou couldst ne'er have thought it. Thy sister's not, O Regan. She has tied in gratitude like a keen vulture here. Kent here set at liberty. I scarce can speak to thee. I pray you, sir, take patience. I have hope that you know less to value her desert than she to slack her duty. Ha! How's that? I cannot think my sister in the least would fail in her respects. But if perchance she has restrained the riots of your followers, tis on such grounds and to such wholesome ends as clears her from all blame. My curse is on her. Oh, sir, you are old and should content you to be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Therefore, sir, return to our sister, and say you have wronged her. Ha! Huh. Ask her forgiveness? No, no. T'was my mistake. Thou didst not mean so. Dear daughter, I confess that I am old. Age is unnecessary. But thou art good, and wilt dispense with my infirmity. Good sir, no more of these unsightly passions. Return back to our sister. Never, Regan. She has abated me of half of my train, looked black upon me, stabbed me with her tongue. All the stored vengeances of heaven fall on her ingrateful head. Strike her young bones, ye taking heirs, with lameness. Oh, the blessed gods! Thus will you wish on me when the rash mood... No, Regan, thou shalt never have my curse. Thy tender nature cannot give thee o'er to such impiety. Thou better know'st the offices of nature, bond of childhood, and dues of gratitude. Thou bearst in mind the half of the kingdom which our love conferred on thee and thine. Good sir, to the purpose. Who put my man i the stocks? What trumpet's that? I know it, my sister's. This confirms her letters. Sir, is your lady come? Enter Goneril's gentleman. More torture still. There is a slave whose easy-borrowed pride dwells in the fickle grace of her he follows, a fashion fop that spends the day in dressing, and all to bear his lady's flattering message, that can deliver with a grace her lie and with as bold a face bring back a greater out varlet from my sight what means your grace who stocked my servant regan i have hope thou didst not know it enter goneril who comes here oh heavens if you do love old men if your sweet sway allow obedience if yourselves are old, make it your cause, send down and take my part. Why, Gorgon, dost thou come to haunt me here? Art not ashamed to look upon this beard? Darkness upon my eyes, they play me false. O Regan, wilt thou take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offence that indiscretion finds, and dotage terms so. Heart, thou art too tough. I pray you, sir, being old, confess you are so. If till the expiration of your month you will return and sojourn with my sister, dismissing half your train, come then to me. I am now from home, and out of that provision that shall be needful for your entertainment. Return with her, and fifty nights dismissed? No, rather I'll forswear all roofs, and choose to be companion to the midnight wolf. 
my naked head exposed to the merciless air than have my smallest wants supplied by her at your choice sir now i prithee daughter do not make me mad i will not trouble thee my child farewell we'll meet no more no more see one another let shame come when it will i do not call it i do not bid the thunder-bearer strike nor tell tales of thee to avenging heaven mend when thou canst be better at thy leisure i can be patient i can stay with regan i and my hundred knights your pardon sir i looked not for you yet nor am provided for your fit welcome is this well spoken now my sister treats you fair what fifty followers is it not well what should you need of more why might not you my lord receive attendance from those whom she calls servants or from mine why not my lord if then they chance to slack you we could control em if you come to me for now i see the danger i entreat you to bring but five and twenty to no more will i give place hold now my temper stand this bolt unmoved and i am thunder-proof the wicked when compared with the more wicked seem beautiful and not to be the worst stands in some rank of praise now goneril thou art innocent again i'll go with thee thy fifty yet does double five and twenty and thou art twice her love hear me my lord what need you five and twenty ten or five to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to attend you what need one blood fire here leprosies and bluest plagues room room for hell to belch her horrors up and drench the circes in a stream of fire hark how the infernals echo to my rage their whips and snakes how lewd a thing is passion so old and stomachful lightning and thunder heavens drop your patience down you see me here ye gods a poor old man as full of griefs as age wretched in both i'll bear no more no you unnatural hags i will have such revenges on you both that all the world shall i will do such things what they are yet i know not but they shall be the terrors of the earth you think i'll weep thunder again this heart shall break into a thousand pieces before i'll weep o oh, gods i shall go mad exit tis a wild night come out of the storm exeunt end of the second act act three of the history of king lear by Naam Tate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act three. Scene A Desert Heath. Scene one. Enter Lear and Kent in the storm. Blow winds and burst your cheeks rage louder yet fantastic lightning singe singe my white head spout cataracts and hurricanos fall till you have drowned the towns and palaces of proud ingrateful man not all my best entreaties can persuade him into some needful shelter or to bide this poor slight covering on his aged head, exposed to this wild war of earth and heaven. Rumble thy fill, fight whirlwind, rain, and fire. Not fire, wind, rain, or thunder are my daughters. I tax not you, ye elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdoms, called you children, 
you owe me no obedience then let fall your horrible pleasure here i stand your slave a poor infirm weak and despised old man yet i will call you servile ministers that have with two pernicious daughters joined their high engendered battle against a head so old and white as mine oh oh tis foul hard by sir is a hovel that will lend some shelter from this tempest i will forget my nature what so kind a father i there's the point consider good my liege things that love night love not such nights as this these wrathful skies frighten the very wanderers of the dark and make them keep their caves such drenching rain such sheets of fire such claps of horrid thunder such groans of roaring winds have ne'er been known let the great gods that keep this dreadful pudder o'er our heads find out their enemies now tremble thou wretch that hast within thee undiscovered crimes hide thou bloody hand thou perjured villain holy holy hypocrite that drinkst the widow's tears sigh now and cry these dreadful summoners grace i am a man more sinned against than sinning good sir to the hovel my wit begins to burn come on my boy how dost my boy art cold i'm cold myself show me this straw my fellow the art of our necessity is strange and can make vile things precious my poor knave louder storm cold as i am at heart i've one place there that's sorry yet for thee exit scene two gloucester's palace enter bastard the storm is in our louder revellings drowned thus would i reign could i but mount a throne the riots of these proud imperial sisters already have imposed the galling yoke of taxes and hard impositions on the drudging peasant's neck who bellow out their loud complaints in vain triumphant queens with what assurance do they tread the crowd oh for a taste of such majestic beauty which none but my hot veins are fit to engage nor are my wishes desperate for even now during the banquet i observed their glances shot thick at me and as they left the room each cast by stealth a kind inviting smile the happy earnest ha huh? two servants from several entrances deliver him each a letter and exit reads where merit is not so transparent not to behold it were blindness and not to reward it ingratitude goneril enough blind and ingrateful should i be not to obey the summons of this oracle now for a second letter opens the other if modesty be not your enemy doubt not to find me your friend regan excellent sibyl oh my glowing blood i am already sick of expectation and pant for the possession here gloucester comes with business on his brow be hushed my joys i come to seek thee edmund to impart a business of importance i knew thy loyal heart is touched to see the cruelty of these ingrateful daughters against our royal master most savage and unnatural <sighs> this change in the state sits uneasy the commons repine aloud at their female tyrants already they cry out for the reinstalment of their good old king whose injuries i fear will inflame them into mutiny tis to be hoped not feared thou hast it boy tis to be hoped indeed on me they cast their eyes and hourly caught me to lead em on 
and whilst this head is mine i am theirs a little covert craft my boy and then for open action twill be employment worthy such honest daring souls as thine thou edmund art my trusty emissary haste on the spur at the first break of day with these dispatches to the duke of cambray gives him letters you know what mortal feuds have always flamed between this duke of cornwall's family and his full twenty thousand mountainers the inveterate prince will send to our assistance dispatch commend us to his grace and prosper aside yes credulous old man i will commend you to his grace his grace the duke of cornwall instantly to show him these contents in thine own character and sealed with thy own signet then forthwith the choleric duke gives sentence on thy life and to my hand thy vast revenues fall to glut my pleasure that till now has starved gloucester going off is met by cordelia entering bastard observing at a distance turn gloucester turn by all the sacred powers i do conjure you give my griefs a hearing you must you shall nay i am sure you will for you were always still the just and good what wouldst thou princess rise and speak thy griefs nay you shall promise to redress them too or here i'll kneel for ever i entreat thy succour for a father and a king an injured father and an injured king o oh, charming sorrow how her tears adorn her like dew on flowers but she is virtuous and i must quench this hopeless fire in the kindling consider princess for whom thou begst tis for the king that wronged thee oh name not that he did not could not wrong me name muse not gloucester for it is too likely this injured king ere this is past your aid and gone distracted with his savage wrongs i'll gaze no more and yet my eyes are charmed oh, what if it be worse can there be worse as tis too probable this furious night has pierced his tender body the bleak winds and cold rain chilled or lightning struck him dead if it be so your promise is discharged and i have only one poor boon to beg that you'd convey me to his breathless trunk with my torn robes to wrap his hoary head with my torn hair to bind his hands and feet then with a shower of tears to wash his clay-smeared cheeks and die beside him rise fair cordelia thou hast piety enough to atone for both thy sister's crimes i have already plotted to restore my injured master and thy virtue tells me we shall succeed and suddenly exit dispatch arant provide me a disguise will instantly go seek the king and bring him some relief how madam are you ignorant of what your impious sisters have decreed immediate death for any that relieve him i cannot dread the furies in this case in such a night as this consider madam for many miles about there's scarce a bush to shelter in therefore no shelter for the king and more our charity to find him out what have not women dared for vicious love and will be shining proofs that they can dare for piety as much blow winds and lightnings fall bold in my virgin innocence i'll fly my royal father to relieve or die exit provide me a disguise will instantly go seek the king <laughs> a lucky change that virtue which i feared would be my hindrance has proved the bond to my design i'll bribe two ruffians that shall at a distance follow and seize him in some desert place and there whilst one retains her t'other shall return to inform me where she's lodged i'll be disguised too whilst they are poaching for me i'll to the duke with these dispatches then to the field where like the vigorous jove i will enjoy this semele in a storm 
It will deaf her cries like drums in battle, lest her groan should pierce my pitying ear, and make the amorous fight less fierce. Exit. Scene three. Storm still. The field scene. Enter Lear and Kent. Here is the place, my lord. Good my lord, enter. The tyranny of this open night's too rough for nature to endure. Let me alone. Good my lord, enter. Wilt break my heart? Beseech you, sir. Thou think'st tis much that this contentious storm invades us to the skin? So tis to thee. But where the greater malady is fixed, the lesser is scarce felt. The tempest in my mind does from my senses take all feeling else save what beats there, filial ingratitude. Is it not as this mouth should tear this hand for lifting food toot? But I'll punish home. No, I will weep no more. In such a night to shut me out, pour on, I will endure in such a night as this. O oh, Regan, Goneril, your kind old father, whose frank heart gave all, oh, that way madness lies. Let me shun that, no more of that. See, my lord, here's the entrance. Well, I'll go in and pass it all. I'll pray and then I'll sleep. Poor naked wretches, wherefore e'er you are that bide the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides sustain this shock? Your raggedness defend you from seasons such as these. Oh, I have taken too little care of this. Take physic, pomp. Expose thyself to feel what wretches feel, that thou mayst cast the superflux to them, and show the heavens more just. Edgar in the hovel five fathom and a half poor tom what art thou that dost grumble there i the straw come forth away the foul fiend follows me through the sharp hawthorn blows the cold wind mom go to thy bed and warm thee ah what do i see by all my griefs the poor old king beheaded and drenched in this foul storm professing serene are all your protestations come to this? Tell me, fellow, didst thou give all to thy daughters? Who gives anything to poor Tom, whom the foul fiend has led through fire and through flame, through bushes and bogs, that has laid knives under his pillow and halters in his pew, that has made him proud of heart to ride in a bay-trotting horse over four-inched bridges, to course his own shadow for a traitor? Bless thy five wits, Tom's a cold. Shivers. Bless thee from whirlwinds, star blasting and taking. Do poor Tom some charity, whom the foul fiend vexes. Sa, sa, there I could have him now, and there, and there again. Have his daughters brought him to this pass? Couldst thou save nothing? Didst thou give em all? He has no daughters, sir. Death, traitor! Nothing could have subdued nature to such a lowness but his unkind daughters. Pillicock sat upon Pillicock Hill. Hello, hello, hello! Is it the fashion that discarded fathers should have such little mercy on their flesh? Ludicrous punishment! Twas this flesh begot those pelican daughters. Take heed of the foul fiend, obey thy parents. Keep thy word justly, swear not, commit not with man's sworn spouse. Set not thy sweetheart on proud array. Tom's a cold. What hast thou been? A serving man proud of heart, that curled my hair, used perfume and washes, that served the lust of my mistress's heart, and did the act of darkness with her. Swore as many oaths as I spoke words, and broke them all in the sweet face of heaven. Let not the paint, nor the patch, nor the rushing of silks betray thy poor heart to woman. Keep thy foot out of brothels, thy hand out of plackets, thy pen from creditor's books, and defy the foul fiend. Still through the hawthorn blows the cold wind. Sss! 
Some mon nonny dolphin, my boy. Whist, the boy, sissy. Soft, let him trot by. Death, thou wert better in thy grave than thus to answer with thy uncovered body this extremity of the sky. And yet consider him well, and man's no more than this. Thou art indebted to the worm for no silk, to the beast for no hide, to the cat for no perfume. Ha! Here's two of us are sophisticated. Thou art the thing itself. Unaccommodated man is no more than such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. Off, off, ye vain disguises, empty lendings. I'll be my original self. Quick, quick, uncase me. Defend his wits, good heaven. One point I had forgot. What's your name? Poor Tom that eats the swimming frog, the walnut, and the water nut, that in the fury of his heart, when the foul fiend rages, eats cow dung for salads, swallows the old rat and the ditch dog, that drinks the green mantle of the standing pool that's whipped from tithing to tithing, that has three suits to his back, six shirts to his body, horse to ride and weapon to wear, but rats and mice and such small deer have been Tom's food for seven long year. Beware, my follower, peace, Spalkin, peace, thou foul fiend. One word more, but be sure, true counsel. Tell me, is a madman a gentleman or a yeoman? I feared twould come to this. His wits are gone. Frateretto calls me and tells me Nero is an angler in the lake of darkness. Pray, innocent, and beware the foul fiend. Right. Ha <laughs> ha. Was it not pleasant to have a thousand with red-hot spits come hissing in upon em? My tears begin to take his part so much, they mar my counterfeiting. The little dogs and all, Trey, Blanche, and Sweetheart, see, they bark at me. Tom will throw his head at them, avaunt ye curs. Be thy mouth or black or white, tooth that poisons if it bite. Mastiff, greyhound, mongrel, grim, hound or spaniel, brach or him, bobtail, tight or trundle tail, Tom will make him weep and wail, for with throwing thus my head, dogs leaped the hatch, and all are fled. Ooh, dee, 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 see, see, see! Come march to wakes and fairs and market towns. Poor Tom, thy horn is dry. You, sir, I entertain you for one of my hundred. Only I do not like the fashion of your garments. You'll say they're Persian, but no matter. Let them be changed. Enter Gloucester. This is the foul flibberty gibbet. He begins at curfew and walks at first cock. He gives the web and the pin, knits the elf lock, squints the eye and makes the hair lip, mildews the white wheat and hurts the poor creature of the earth. Swithin footed thrice the cold. He met the nightmare and her ninefold. Twas there he did appoint her. He bid her alight and her troth plight, and aroint the witch aroint her. What has your grace no better company? The Prince of Darkness is a gentleman. Modo he is called, and Mahu. Go with me, sir. Hard by I have a tenant. My duty cannot suffer me to obey in all your daughter's hard commands, who have enjoined me to make fast my doors, and let this tyrannous knight take hold upon you. Yet have I ventured to come seek you out, and bring you where both fire and food is ready. Good my lord, take his offer. First let me talk with this philosopher. Say, Stagirite, what is the cause of thunder? Beseech you, sir, go with me. I'll talk a word with this same learned Theban. What is your study? How to prevent the fiend and to kill vermin. Let me ask you a word in private. His wits are quite unsettled. Good sir, let's force him hence. Oh, canst blame him his daughters seek his death this bedlam but disturbs him the more fellow be gone 
child roland to the dark tower came his word was still fee fo fum i smell the blood of a british man o oh, torture exit now i prithee friend let's take him in our arms and carry him where he shall meet both welcome and protection good sir along with us you say right let em anatomize regan see what breeds about her heart is there any cause in nature for these hard hearts beseech your grace St make no noise make no noise so so we'll to supper i the morning exeunt scene four enter cordelia and arante dear madam rest ye here our search is vain look here's a shed beseech ye enter here prethee go in thyself seek thy own ease where the mind's free the body's delicate this tempest but diverts me from the thought of what would hurt me more enter two ruffians we have dodged em far enough this place is private i'll keep em prisoners here within this hovel whilst you return and bring lord edmund hither but help me first to house em nothing but this dear devil shows gold should have drawn me through all this tempest but to our work they seize Cordelia and Arante, who shriek out, Soft, madame, we are friends. Dispatch, I say. Help, murder, help! Gods, some kind thunderbolt to strike me dead. Enter Edgar. What cry was that? Ha, ah, women seized by ruffians. Is this a place and time for villainy? Avaunt ye bloodhounds. Drives them with his quarter-staff. The, the devil! devil! The devil! They run off. O oh, speak! What are ye that appear to be o' oh, the tender sex, and yet unguarded wander through the dead mazes of this dreadful night, where though at full the clouded moon scarce darts in perfect glimmerings? First, say what art thou, our guardian angel, that wert pleased to assume that horrid shape to fright the ravishers? We'll kneel to thee. O oh, my tumultuous blood! by all my trembling veins cordelia's voice tis she herself my senses sure conform to my wild garb and i am mad indeed whate'er thou art befriend a wretched virgin and if thou canst direct our weary search who relieves poor tom that sleeps on the nettle with the hedge pig for his pillow while smug plied the bellows she trapped with her fellows the freckle fact mob was a blows and a drab yet swithin made oberon jealous o oh, torture alack madam a poor wandering lunatic and yet his language seemed but now well tempered speak friend to one more wretched than thyself and if thou hast one interval of sense inform us if thou canst where we may find a poor old man who through his health has strayed the tedious night speak Sawst thou such a one? Aside. The king her father, whom she's come to seek through all the terrors of this night, O oh gods, that such amazing piety, such tenderness, should yet to me be cruel. Yes, fair one, such a one was lately here, and is conveyed by some that came to seek him, to a neighbouring cottage, but distinctly where I know not. Blessings on him. Let's find him out, Arant. For thou seest we are in heaven's protection. Going off. O oh, Cordelia. Ha! Thou know'st my name. As you did once know Edgar's. Edgar. The poor remains of Edgar. What your scorn has left him. Do we wake, Arant? My father seeks my life, which I preserved in hopes of some blessed minute to oblige distressed Cordelia, and the gods have given it. That thought alone prevailed with me to take this frantic dress, to make the earth my bed, with these bare limbs all change of seasons bide, noon scorching heat and midnight's piercing cold, to feed on offals and to drink with herds, to combat with the winds and be the sport of clowns, or what's more wretched yet, their pity. Was ever tale so full of misery? 
but such a fall as this i grant was due to my aspiring love for twas presumptuous though not presumptuously pursued for well you know i wore my flames concealed and silent as the lamps that burn in tombs till you perceived my grief with modest grace drew forth the secret and then sealed my pardon you had your pardon nor can you challenge more what do i challenge more such vanity agrees not with these rags but in my prosperous state rich gloucester's heir you silenced my pretences and enjoined me to trouble you upon that theme no more then what reception must love's language find from these bare limbs and beggars humble weeds such as the voice of pardon to a wretch condemned such as the shouts of succouring forces to a town besieged ah what new method now of cruelty come to my arms thou dearest best of men and take the kindest vows that e'er were spoke by a protesting maid is't possible by the dear vital stream that baths my heart these hallowed rags of thine and naked virtue these abject tassels these fantastic shreds ridiculous even to the meanest clown to me are dearer than the richest pomp of purple monarchs generous charming maid the gods alone that made can rate thy worth this most amazing excellence shall be fame's triumph in succeeding ages when thy bright example shall adorn the scene and teach the world perfection cold and weary we'll rest awhile our aunt on that straw then forward to find out the poor old king look i have flint and steel the implements of wandering lunatics i'll strike a light and make a fire beneath this shed to dry thy storm-drenched garments ere thou lie to rest thee then fierce and wakeful as tesperian dragon i'll watch beside thee to protect thy sleep meanwhile the stars shall dart their kindest beams and angels visit my cordelia's dreams exeunt scene five scene the palace enter cornwall regan bastard servants cornwall with gloucester's letters i will have my revenge ere i depart his house regan see here a plot upon our state tis gloucester's character that has betrayed his double trust of subject and of host then double be our vengeance this confirms the intelligence that we now now received that he has been this night to seek the king but who sir was the kind discoverer our eagle quick to spy and fierce to seize our trusty edmund twas a noble service o cornwall take him to thy deepest trust and wear him as a jewel at thy heart think sir how hard a fortune i sustain that makes me thus repent of serving you weeps oh that this treason had not been or i not the discoverer edmund thou shalt find a father in our love and from this minute we call thee earl of gloucester but there yet remains another justice to be done and that's to punish this discarded traitor but lest thy tender nature should relent at his just sufferings nor brook the sight we wish thee to withdraw to edmund aside the grotto sir within the lower grove has privacy to suit a mourner's thought and there i may expect a comforter ha madam what may happen sir i know not but twas a friend's advice exit bastard bring in the traitor gloucester brought in bind fast his arms oh, what mean your graces you are my guests pray do me no foul play bind him i say hard harder yet now traitor thou shalt find speak rebel where hast thou sent the king whom spite of our decree thou sawst last night i'm tied to the stake and i must stand the course say where and why thou hast concealed him oh, 
because i would not see thy cruel hands tear out his poor old eyes nor thy fierce sister carve his anointed flesh oh, but i shall see the swift winged vengeance overtake such children see it shalt thou never slaves perform your work out with those treacherous eyes dispatch i say if thou seest vengeance oh, he that will think to live till he be old give me some help oh cruel oh ye gods they put out his eyes <laughs> hold hold my lord i bar your cruelty i cannot love your safety and give way to such a barbarous practice ha my villain i have been your servant from my infancy but better service have i never done you than with this boldness take thy death slave nay then revenge whilst yet my blood is warm fight help here are you not hurt my lord edmund enkindle all the sparks of nature to quit this horrid act out treacherous villain thou call'st on him that hates thee it was he that broached thy treason shewed us thy dispatches there read and save the cambrian prince a labour if thy eyes fail thee call for spectacles oh my folly then edgar was abused kind gods forgive me that <laughs> how is't my lord turn out that eyeless villain let him smell his way to cambray throw this slave upon a dunghill regan i bleed apace give me your arm exeunt oh all dark and comfortless where are those various objects that but now employed my busy eyes where those eyes dead are their piercing rays that lately shot o'er flowery vales to distant sunny hills and drew with joy the vast horizon in these groping hands are now my only guides and feeling all my sight o oh, misery what words can sound my grief shut from the living whilst among the living dark as the grave amidst the bustling world at once from business and from pleasure barred no more to view the beauty of the spring nor see the face of kindred or a friend yet still one way the extremest fate affords and even the blind can find the way to death must i then tamely die and unrevenged so lear may fall no with these bleeding rings i will present me to the pitying crowd and with the rhetoric of these dropping veins enflame them to revenge their king and me then when the glorious mischief is on wing this lumber from some precipice i'll throw and dash it on the ragged flint below whence my freed soul to her bright sphere shall fly through boundless orbs eternal regions spy and like the sun be all one glorious I Exit End of the Third Act
Act Four of the History of King Lear by Nahum Tate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One A Grotto. Edmund and Regan amorously seated, listening to music. Why were those beauties made another's right which none can prize like me? Charming queen, take all my blooming youth, forever fold me in those soft arms, lull me in endless sleep that I may dream of pleasures too transporting for life to bear. Live, live, my Gloucester, and feel no death but that of swooning joy. I yield thee blisses on no harder terms than that thou continue to be happy. This jealousy is yet more kind. Is't possible that I should wander from a paradise to feed on sickly weeds? Such sweets live here that constancy will be no virtue in me. Aside. And yet must I forthwith go to meet her sister, to whom I must protest as much. Suppose it be the same. Why, best of all, and I have then my lesson ready conned. Wear this remembrance of me. I dare now. Gives him a ring. Absent myself no longer from the duke, whose wound grows dangerous, I hope mortal. And let this happy image of your Gloucester. Pulling out a picture, drops a note. Lodge in that breast where all his treasure lies. Exit. To this brave youth a woman's blooming beauties are due. My fool usurps my bed. What's here? Confusion on my eyes. Reads. Where merit is so transparent, not to behold it were blindness, and not to reward it ingratitude. Goneril. Vexatious accident! Yet fortunate, too. My jealousy is confirmed, and I am taught to cast for my defence. Enter an officer. Now, what mean those shouts, and what thy hasty entrance? A most surprising and a sudden change. The peasants are all up in mutiny and only want a chief to lead him on to storm your palace. On what provocation? At last day's public festival, to which the yeomen from all quarters had repaired, old Gloucester, whom you late deprived of sight, his veins yet streaming fresh, presents himself, proclaims your cruelty and their oppression, with the king's injuries, which so enraged them, that now that mutiny, which long had crept, takes wing and threatens your best powers. White-livered slave, our forces raised and led by valiant Edmund shall drive this monster of rebellion back to her dark cell. Young Gloucester's arm allays the storm his father's feeble breath did raise. Exit. Scene two. The field. Scene. Enter Edgar. The lowest and most abject thing of fortune. Stand still in hope and is secure from fear. The lamentable change is from the best. The worst returns to better. Who comes here? Enter Gloucester, led by an old man. My father poorly led, deprived of sight, the precious stones torn from their bleeding rings. Something I heard of this inhumane deed, but disbelieved it, as an act too horrid for the hot hell of a cursed woman's fury. When will the measure of my woes be full? Revenge! Thou art afoot! Success attend thee! Well have I sold my eyes, if the event prove happy for the injured king. Oh, my good lord, I have been your tenant, and your father as tenant these four score years. Away! Get thee away, good friend! Be gone. Thy comforts can do me no good at all. Thee they may hurt. You cannot see your way. I have no way, and therefore want no eyes. 
i stumbled when i saw o oh, dear son edgar the food of thy abused father's wrath might i but live to see thee in my touch i'd say i had eyes again alas he's sensible that i was wronged and should i own myself his tender heart would break betwixt the extremes of grief and joy oh no who's there a charity for poor tom play fair and defy the foul fiend O oh, gods, and must I still pursue this trade? Aside. Trifling beneath such loads of misery? Tis poor mad Tom. In the late storm I such a fellow saw, Which made me think a man a worm. Where is the lunatic? Here, my lord. Get thee now away if for my sake thou wilt or take us hence a mile or two in the way toward dover do it for ancient love and bring me some covering for this naked wretch whom i'll entreat to lead me alack my lord he's mad what oh, is the time's plague when madmen lead the blind do as i bid thee I'll bring him the best peril that I have, come on what will. Exit. Sirrah, naked fellow. Poor Tom's a cold. I cannot fool it longer, and yet I must. Bless thy sweet eyes, they bleed. Believed poor Tom even weeps his blind to see them. Knowst thou the way to Dover? Both stile and gate, horseway and footpath poor tom has been scared out of his good wits bless every true man's son from the foul fiend here take this purse that i am wretched makes thee the happier heaven deal so still thus let the griping usurer's hoard be scattered so distribution shall undo excess and each man have enough dost thou know dover ay master there is a cliff whose high and bending head looks dreadfully down on the roaring deep bring me but to the very brink of it and i'll repair the poverty thou bearest with something rich about me from that place i shall no leading need give me thy arm poor tom shall guide thee soft for i hear the tread of passengers enter kent and cordelia ah me your fear's too true it was the king i spoke but now with some that met him as mad as the vexed sea singing aloud crowned with rank femider and furrow weeds with berries burdocks violets daisies poppies and all the idle flowers that grow in our sustaining corn conduct me to him to prove my last endeavours to restore him and heaven so prosper thee i will good lady ha gloucester here turn poor dark man and hear a friend's condolement who at sight of thine forgets his own distress thy old true kent how oh, kent from whence returned I have not since my banishment been absent, but in disguise followed the abandoned king. Twas me thou sawst with him in the late storm. Oh, let me embrace thee. Had I eyes, I now should weep for joy. But let this trickling blood suffice instead of tears. O oh, misery! To whom shall I complain, or in what language? Forgive, O oh wretched man, the piety that brought thee to this pass. Twas I that caused it. I cast me at thy feet and beg of thee to crush these weeping eyes to equal darkness, if that will give thee any recompense. Aside. Was ever season so distressed as this? I think Cordelia's voice. 
rise pious princess and take a dark man's blessing oh my edgar my virtues now grown guilty works the bane of those that do befriend me heaven forsakes me and when you look that way it is but just that you should hate me too o oh, wave this cutting speech and spare to wound a heart that's on the rack no longer cloud thee kent in that disguise there's business for thee and of noblest weight our injured country is at length in arms urged by the king's inhuman wrongs and mine and only want a chief to lead em on that task be thine aside brave britons then there's life and yet then have we one cast for our fortune yet come princess i'll bestow you with the king then on the spur to head these forces farewell good gloucester to our conduct trust and be your cause as prosperous as tis just exeunt scene three goneril's palace enter goneril attendants it was great ignorance gloucester's eyes being out to let him live where he arrives he moves all hearts against us edmund i think is gone in pity to his misery to dispatch him no madam he's returned on speedy summons back to your sister ha i like not that such speed must have the wings of love where's albany madam within but never man so changed i told him of the uproar of the peasants he smiled at it when i informed him of gloucester's treason trouble him no further it is his coward spirit back to our sister hasten her musters and let her know i have given the distaff into my husband's hands that done with special care deliver these dispatches in private to young gloucester enter a messenger o oh, madam most unreasonable news the duke of cornwall's dead of his late wound whose loss your sister has in part supplied making brave edmund general of her forces one way i like this well but being widow and my gloucester with her may blast the promised harvest of our love a word more sir add speed to your journey and if you chance to meet with that blind traitor preferment falls on him that cuts him off Exeunt. Scene four. Field scene. Gloucester and Edgar. <sighs> when shall we come to the top of that same hill? We climb it now. Mark how we labour. Methinks the ground is even. Horrible steep. Hark, do you hear the sea? No, truly. Why then your other senses grow imperfect? by your eyes anguish so may it be indeed methinks thy voice is altered and thou speak'st in better phrase and matter than thou didst you are much deceived in nothing am i altered but in my garments methinks you are better spoken come on sir here's the place how fearful and dizzy tis to cast one's eyes so low the crows and coughs that wing the midway air show scarce so big as beetles half way down hangs one that gathers sampire dreadful trade the fishermen that walk upon the beach appear like mice and yon tall anchoring bark seems lessened to her cock her cock a boy almost too small for sight the murmuring surge cannot be heard so high i look no more lest my brain turn and the disorder make me tumble down headlong set me where you stand you are now within a foot of the extreme verge for all beneath the moon i would not now leap forward let go my hand here friend is another purse in it a jewel well worth a poor man's taking get thee further bid me farewell and let me hear thee going fare you well sir that i do trifle thus with this his despair 
is with design to cure it thus mighty gods this world i do renounce and in your sight shake my afflictions off if i could bear em longer and not fall to quarrel with your great opposeless wills my snuff and feebler part of nature should burn itself out if edgar live oh bless him now fellow fare thee well gone sir farewell and yet i know not how conceit may rob the treasury of life had he been where he thought by this had thought been passed alive or dead ho oh, sir friend hear you sir speak thus might he pass indeed yet he revives what are you sir away and let me die hadst thou been aught but gossamer feathers air falling so many fathom down thou hadst shivered like an egg but thou dost breathe hast heavy substance bleeds not speak'st art sound thy lives a miracle but have i fallen or no from the dread summit of this chalky bourne look up and height the shrill tuned a lark so high cannot be seen or heard do but look up alack i have no eyes is wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself by death give me your arm up so how is't feel you your legs you stand oh, too well too well upon the crow of the cliff what thing was that which parted from you a poor unfortunate beggar as i stood here below methought his eyes were two full moons wide nostrils breathing fire it was some fiend therefore thou happy father think that dull powerful gods who make them honours of men's impossibilities have preserved thee oh, it is wonderful henceforth i'll bear affliction till it expire the goblin which you speak of i took it for a man oft times twould say the fiend the fiend he led me to that place bear free and patient thoughts but who comes here enter lear a coronet of flowers on his head wreaths and garlands about him no no they cannot touch me for coining i am the king himself o oh, piercing sight nature's above art in that respect there's your press money that fellow handles his bow like a cow-keeper draw me a clothier's yard a mouse a mouse peace ho oh. there's my gauntlet i'll prove it on a giant bring up the brown bills O oh, well flown bird, i the white, i the white, phew! Give the word. Sweet marjoram. Pass. I know that voice. Ha! Goneril with a white beard. They flattered me like a dog, and told me I had white hairs on my chin before the black ones were there. To say I and no to everything that I said, I and no, too, was no good divinity. When the rain came once to wet me, and the winds to make me chatter, when the thunder would not peace at my bidding, there I found em, there I smelt em out, go to, they are not men of their words. They told me I was a king, tis a lie, I am not argue-proof that voice i well remember is not the king's ay every inch a king when i do stare see how the subject quakes i pardon that man's life what was the cause adultery thou shalt not die die for adultery the wren goes toot and the small gilded fly engenders in my sight let copulation thrive for Gloucester's bastard son was kinder to his father 
than were my daughters got i the lawful bed toot luxury pell-mell for i lack soldiers oh, not all my sorrows past so deep have touched me as these sad accents sight were now a torment behold that simpering lady she that starts at pleasure's name and thinks her ear profaned with the least wanton word would you believe it the fitcher nor the pampered steed goes to it with such a riotous appetite down from the waist they are centaurs though women all above but to the girdle do the gods inherit beneath is all the fiends there's hell there's darkness the sulphurous unfathomed fie fie pa an ounce of civet good apothecary to sweeten my imagination there's money for thee let me kiss that hand let me wipe it first it smells of mortality speak sir do you know me i remember thy eyes well enough nay do thy worst blind cupid i'll not love read me this challenge mark but the penning of it were all the letters sons i could not see i would not take this from report wretched cordelia what will thy virtue do when thou shalt find this fresh affliction added to the tale of thy unparalleled griefs read what with this case of eyes oh ho are you there with me no eyes in your head and no money in your purse yet you see how this world goes i see it feelingly what art mad a man may see how this world goes with no eyes look with thy ears see how yon justice rails on that simple thief shake em together and the first that drops be it thief or justice is a villain thou hast seen a farmer's dog bark at a beggar ay sir and the man run from the cur there thou mightst behold the great image of authority a dog's obeyed in office thou rascal beadle hold thy bloody hand why dost thou lash that strumpet thou hotly lustest to enjoy her in that kind for which thou whipst her do do the judge that sentenced her has been beforehand with thee oh how stiff is my vile sense that yields not yet i tell thee the usurer hangs the cousiner through tattered robes small vices do appear robes and fur gowns hide all place sins with gold why there tis for thee my friend make much of it it has the power to seal the accuser's lips get thee glass eyes and like a scurvy politician seem to see the things thou dost not pull pull off my boots hard harder so so o oh, matter and impertinency mixed reason in madness if thou wilt weep my fortunes take my eyes i know thee well enough thy name is gloucester thou must be patient we came crying hither thou knowest the first time that we taste the air we wail and cry i'll preach to thee mark break laboring heart when we are born we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools enter two or three gentlemen o oh, harrius lay hand upon him sir your dearest daughter sends no rescue what a prisoner i am even the natural fool of fortune use me well you shall have ransom let me have surgeons oh i am cut to the brains you shall have anything no seconds all myself i will die bravely like a smug bridegroom 
flushed and pampered as a priest's whore i am a king my masters know ye that you are a royal one and we obey you it were an excellent stratagem to shoe a troop of horse with felt i'll put in proof no noise no noise now will we steal upon these sons-in-law and then kill 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 exit running a sight most moving in the meanest wretch past speaking in a king now good sir what are you a most poor man made tame to fortune strokes and prone to pity by experienced sorrows give me your hand you ever gentle gods take my breath from me and let not my ill genius tempt me more to die before you please enter goneril's gentleman usher a proclaimed prize o most happily met that eyeless head of thine was first framed flesh to raise my fortunes thou old unhappy traitor the sword is out that must destroy thee now let thy friendly hand put strength enough to it wherefore bold peasant there's thou support a published traitor hence lest i destroy thee too let go his arm Chill not let go sir without further occasion let go slave or thou diest good gentlemen go your gate and let poor volk pass and should have been swaggered out of my life it would not have been so long as tis by a fortnight nay and thou comest near the old man i's try whether your costard or my ballow be the harder out dunghill chill pick your teeth sir come no matter for your vines slave thou hast slain me o oh, untimely death i know thee well a serviceable villain as duteous to the vices of thy mistress as lust could wish what is he dead sit you sir and rest you this is a letter carrier and may have some papers of intelligence that may stand our party in good stead to know what's here takes a letter out of his pocket, opens, and reads. To Edmund, Earl of Gloucester, let our mutual loves be remembered. You have many opportunities to cut him off. If he return the conqueror, then I am still a prisoner, and his bed my jail, from the loathed warmth of which deliver me, and supply the place for your labour. Goneril a plot upon her husband's life and the exchange my brother here are the sands i'll rake thee up thou messenger of lust grieved only that thou hast no other deathsman in time and place convenient i'll produce these letters to the sight of the injured duke as best shall serve our purpose come your hand far off methinks i hear the beaten drum come sir I will bestow you with a friend. Exeunt. Scene five. A chamber. Lear asleep on a couch, Cordelia and attendants standing by him. His sleep is sound and may have good effect to cure his jarring senses and repair this breach of nature. We have employed the utmost power of art, and this deep rest will perfect our design. O oh, Regan, Goneril, inhumane sisters, had he not been your father, these white hairs had challenged sure some pity. Was this a face to be exposed against the jarring winds? My enemy's dog, though he had bit me, should have stood that night against my fire. He wakes. Speak to him. Madam, to you, tis fittest. How does my royal lord? How fares your majesty? You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Ha! Ah, is this too a world of cruelty? I know my privilege. Think not that I will be used still like a wretched mortal. No, no more of that. Speak to me, sir. Who am I? 
you are a soul in bliss but i am bound upon a wheel of fire which my own tears do scald like molten lead sir do you know me you are a spirit i know where did you die still still far wide madam he's scarce awake he'll soon grow more composed where have i been where am i fair daylight i am mightily abused i should e'en die with pity to see another thus i will not swear these are my hands oh look upon me sir and hold your hands in blessing o'er me nay you must not kneel pray do not mock me i am a very foolish fond old man fourscore and upward and to deal plainly with you i fear i am not in my perfect mind nay then farewell to patience witness for me ye mighty powers i never complain till now methinks i should know you and know this man yet i am doubtful for i am mainly ignorant what place this is and all the skill i have remembers not these garments nor do i know where i did sleep last night pray do not mock me for as i am a man i think that lady to be my child cordelia oh my dear dear father be your tears wet yes faith pray do not weep for i have given thee cause and am so humbled with crosses since that i could ask forgiveness of thee were it possible that thou couldst grant it but i am well assured thou canst not therefore i do stand thy justice if thou hast poison for me i will drink it bless thee and die o oh, pity sir a bleeding heart and cease this killing language tell me friends where am i in your own kingdom sir do not abuse me be comforted to good madam for the violence of his distempered past will lead him in nor trouble him till he is better settled will it please you sir walk into freer air you must bear with me i am old and foolish they lead him off the gods restore you hark i hear afar the beaten drum old kent's a man of's word oh for an arm like the fierce thunderers when the earth-born sun stormed heaven to fight this injured father's battle that i could shift my sex and die me deep in his opposer's blood but as i may with women's weapons piety and prayers i'll aid his cause you never erring gods fight on his side and thunder on his foes such tempest as his poor aged head sustained your image suffers when a monarch bleeds tis your own cause for that your succors bring revenge yourselves and write an injured king end of the fourth act act five of the history of king lear by Nahum tate this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Act Five, Scene One. Scene, a camp. Enter Goneril and attendants. Our sister's powers already are arrived, and she herself has promised to prevent the night with her approach. Have you provided the banquet I bespoke for her reception at my tent? So, please your grace, we have. But thou, my poisoner, must prepare the bowl that crowns this banquet when our mirth is high the trumpets sounding and the flutes replying then is the time to give this fatal draught to this imperious sister if then our arms succeed edmund more dear than victory is mine but if defeat or death itself attend me 
twill charm my ghost to think I've left behind me. Trumpet. No happy rival. Hark, she comes. Exeunt. Scene two. Enter Bastard in his tent. To both these sisters have I sworn my love, each jealous of the other as the stung are of the adder. Neither can be held if both remain alive. Where shall I fix? Cornwall is dead, and Regan's empty bed seems cast by fortune for me. But already I have enjoyed her, and bright Goneril with equal charms brings dear variety and yet untasted beauty. I will use her husband's countenance for the battle, then usurp at once his bed and throne. Enter officers. My trusty scouts, you are well returned. Have ye described the strength and posture of the enemy? We have, and were surprised to find the banished Kent returned, and at their head. Your brother Edgar on the rear, old Gloucester, a moving spectacle, led through their ranks, whose powerful tongue and more prevailing wrongs have so enraged their rustic spirits that with the approaching dawn we must expect their battle. You bring a welcome hearing each to his charge. Line well your ranks, and stand on your reward. To-night repose you, and in the morn will give the sun a sight that shall be worth his rising. Exeunt. Scene three. Scene. A valley near the camp. Enter Edgar and Gloucester. Here, sir, take you the shadow of this tree, for your good host. Pray that the right may thrive. If ever I return to you again, I'll bring you comfort. Exit. Thanks, friendly sir. The fortune your good cause deserves betide you. An alarum, after which Gloucester speaks. Oh, the fight grows hot. The whole war's now at work, and the gored battle bleeds in every vein whilst drums and trumpets drown loud slaughter's roar. Where's Gloucester now that used to head the fray and scour the ranks where deadliest danger lay? Here, like a shepherd in a lonely shade, idle, unarmed, and listening to the fight, Yet the disabled courser, maimed and blind, when to his stall he hears the rattling war, foaming with rage, tears up the battered ground, and tugs for liberty. No more of shelter, thou blind worm, but forth to the open field. The war may come this way, and crush thee into rest. Here lay thee down and tear the earth, that work befits a mole. Oh, dark despair, when, Edgar, wilt thou come to pardon and dismiss me to the grave? A retreat sounded. Hark, a retreat! The king has lost or won. Re-enter Edgar, bloody. Away, old man, give me your hand. Away! King Lear has lost, he and his daughter Tain, and this, ye gods, is all that I can save of this most precious wreck. Give me your hand. No father, sir, a man may rot even here. What, in ill thoughts again? Men must endure their going hence, even as their coming hither. And that's true, too. Exeunt. Scene four. Flourish. Enter in conquest, Albany, Goneril, Regan, Bastard. Lear, Kent, Cordelia, prisoners. It is enough to have conquered. Cruelty should ne'er survive the fight. Captain of the guards, treat well your royal prisoners till you have our further orders, as you hold our pleasure. Hark, sir, not as you hold our husband's pleasure. To the captain aside. But as you hold your life, dispatch your prisoners. 
our empire can have no sure settlement but in their death the earth that covers them binds fast our throne let me hear they are dead i shall obey your orders sir i approve it safest to pronounce sentence of death upon this wretched king whose age has charms in it his title more to draw the commons once more to his side twere best prevent sir by your favour i hold you but a subject of this war not as a brother that's as we list to grace him have you forgot that he did lead our powers bore the commission of our place and person and that authority may well stand up and call itself your brother not so hot in his own merits he exalts himself more than in your addition enter edgar disguised what art thou pardon me sir that i presume to stop a prince and conqueror yet ere you triumph give ear to what a stranger can deliver of what concerns you more than triumph can i do impeach your general there of treason lord edmund that usurps the name of gloucester of foulest practice gainst your life and honour this charge is true and wretched though i seem i can produce a champion that will prove in single combat what i do avouch if edmund dares but trust his cause and sword what will not edmund dare my lord i beg the favour that you instantly appoint the place where i may meet this challenger whom i will sacrifice to my wronged fame remember sir that injured honour is nice and cannot brook delay anon before our tent in the army's view there let the herald cry i thank your highness in my champion's name he'll wait your trumpet's call lead exeunt scene five manent lear kent cordelia guarded o oh, kent cordelia you are the only pair that i e'er wronged and the just gods have made you witnesses of my disgrace the very shame of fortune to see me chained and shackled at these years yet were you but spectators of my woes not fellow sufferers all were well this language sir adds yet to our affliction thou kent didst head the troops that fought my battle exposed thy life and fortunes for a master that had as i remember banished thee pardon me sir that once i broke your orders banished by you i kept me here disguised to watch your fortunes and protect your person you know you entertained a rough blunt fellow one caius and you thought he did you service my trusty cages i have lost him too weeps twas a rough honesty i was that caius disguised in that coarse dress to follow you my cages too wert thou my trusty cages enough enough ah me he faints his blood forsakes his cheek help kent no no they shall not see us weep we'll see them rot first guards lead away to prison come kent cordelia come we too will sit alone like birds of the cage when thou dost ask me blessing i'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness thus we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies hear sycophants talk of court news and we'll talk with them too who loses and who wins who's in who's out and take upon us the mystery of things as if we were heaven's spies upon such sacrifices the gods themselves throw incense have i caught ye he that parts us must bring a brand from heaven together we'll out toil the spite of hell and die the wonders of the world away exeunt guarded scene six flourish enter before the tents albany goneril regan guards and attendants goneril speaking apart to the captain of the guards entering here's gold for thee thou knowest our late command upon your prisoners lives about it straight 
and at our evening banquet let it raise our mirth to hear that they are dead. I shall not fail your orders. Exit. Albany, Goneril, Regan, take their seats. Now, Gloucester, trust to thy single virtue, for thy soldiers, all levied in my name, have in my name took their discharge. Now let our trumpets speak, and herald, read out this. Reads. If any man of quality within the lists of the army will maintain upon Edmund, supposed Earl of Gloucester, that he is manifold traitor, let him appear by the third sound of the trumpet. He is bold in his defence. Again. Again. Trumpet answers from within. Enter Edgar, armed. Lord Edgar. Ha! Huh, my brother! This is the only combatant that I could fear, for in my breast guilt duels on his side. But, conscience, what have I to do with thee? Or thou thy dull legitimate slaves? But I was born a libertine, and so I keep me. My noble prince, a word ere we engage. Into your highness's hands I give this paper. It will the truth of my impeachment prove, whatever be my fortune in the fight. We shall peruse it. Now, Edmund, draw thy sword, that if my speech has wronged a noble heart, thy arm may do thee justice. Here are the presents of this high prince, these queens, and this crowned list. I brand thee with the spotted name of traitor, false to thy gods, thy father and thy brother, and what is more, thy friend, false to this prince. If then thou sharest a spark of Gloucester's virtue, acquit thyself, or if thou sharest his courage, meet this defiance bravely. And dares Edgar, the beaten, routed Edgar, brave his conqueror? From all thy troops and thee I forced the field. Thou hast lost the general stake, and art thou now come with thy petty single stock to play this after game? Half-blooded man, thy father sin first, then his punishment. The dark and vicious place where he begot thee, cost him his eyes. From thy licentious mother thou drawst thy villainy. But for thy part of Gloucester's blood, I hold thee worth my sword. Thou bearest thee on thy mother's piety, which I despise. Thy mother being chaste, thou art assured thou art but Gloucester's son. But mine, disdaining constancy, leaves me to hope that I am sprung from nobler blood, and possibly a king might be my sire. But be my birth's uncertain chance as twill, who twas that had the hit to father me I know not. Tis enough that I am I. Of this one thing I'm certain, that I have a daring soul, and so have at thy heart. Sound, trumpet! Fight! Bastard falls! Save, save him, him! Save him! Save him! Save him! This was practice, Gloucester. Thou wantst the field, and wast not bound to fight a vanquished enemy. Thou art not conquered, but cozened and betrayed. Shut your mouth, lady, or with this paper I shall stop it. Hold, sir, thou worse than any name, read thy own evil. No tearing, lady, I perceive you know it. Say if I do, who shall arraign me for it? The laws are mine, not thine. Most monstrous! Ah, thou knowest it too. Ask me not what I know. I have not breath to answer idle questions. I have resolved. Your right, brave sir, has conquered. To Edgar. Along with me, I must consult your father. Exeunt Albany and Edgar. Help every hand to save a noble life. My half of the kingdom for a man of skill to stop this precious stream. Away, ye empirix! Torment me not with your vain offices. The sword has pierced too far. Legitimacy at last has got it. The pride of nature dies. Away! The minutes are too precious. Disturb us not with thy impertinent sorrow. Art thou my rival, then, professed? Why was our love a secret? Could there be beauty like mine, and gallantry like his, and not a mutual love? Just nature then had erred. Behold that copy of perfection, that youth, 
whose story will have no foul page but where it says he stooped to Regan's arms, which yet was but compliance, not affection, a charity to begging, ruined beauty. Who begged when Goneril writ that? Expose it. Throws her a letter. And let it be your army's mirth, as twas this charming youth's and mine, when in the bower he breathed the warmest ecstasies of love, then panting on my breast cried, Matchless Regan, that Goneril and thou should e'er be kin. Die, Circe, for thy charms are at an end. Expire before my face, and let me see how well that boasted beauty will become congealing blood and death's convulsive pangs. Die and be hushed, for at my tent last night thou drankst thy bane amidst thy revelling balls. Ha! Dost thou smile? Is then thy death thy sport? Or has the trusty potion made thee mad? Thou comest as short of me in thy revenge, as in my Gloucester's love. My jealousy inspired me to prevent thy feeble malice, and poison thee at thy own banquet. Ha! No more, my queens, of this untimely strife. You both deserved my love, and both possess it. Come, soldiers, bear me in, and let your royal presence grace my last minutes. Now, Edgar, thy proud conquest I forgive. Who would not choose like me to yield his breath, to have rival queens contend for him in death? Exeunt. Scene seven. Scene a prison. Lear asleep, with his head on Cordelia's lap. What toils, thou wretched king, hast thou endured, To make thee draw, in chains, a sleep so sound? Thy better angel charm thy ravished mind With fancied freedom. Peace is us to lodge. On cottage straw thou hast the beggar's bed, Therefore shouldst have the beggar's careless thought. And now, my Edgar, I remember thee. What fate has seized thee in this general wreck, I know not. But I know thou must be wretched, Because Cordelia holds thee dear. O oh, gods! A sedane gloom overwhelms me, and the image of death o'erspreads the place. Ha! Who are these? Enter captain and officers with cords. Now, sirs, dispatch. Already you are paid in part. The best of your rewards to come. Charge! Charge upon their flank! Their last wing halts. Push! Push the battle, and the day's our own. Their ranks are broke. Down, down with Albany. Who holds my hands? O oh, thou deceiving sleep! I was this very minute on the chase, and now a prisoner here. What mean the slaves? You will not murder me. Help earth and heaven, for your soul's sakes, dear sirs, and for the gods. No tears, good lady. No pleading against gold and preferment. Come, sirs, make ready your cords. You, sir, all seize. You have a humane form, and if no prayers can touch your soul to spare a poor king's life, if there be anything that you hold dear, by that I beg you to dispatch me first. Comply with her request. Dispatch her first. Off, hellhounds! By the gods I charge you spare her. Tis my Cordelia my true pious daughter. No pity? Nay, then, take an old man's vengeance. Snatches a partisan and strikes down two of them. The rest quit Cordelia and turn upon him. Enter Edgar and Albany. Death, hell! Ye vultures hold your impious hands, or take a speedier death than you would give. By whose command? Behold the duke your lord. Gods, seize those instruments of cruelty. My Edgar, oh! My dear Cordelia, lucky was the minute of our approach. The gods have weighed our sufferings. We are past the fire, and now must shine to ages. Look here, my lord. See where the generous king has slain two of them. Did I not, fellow? I've seen the day. With my good biting falchion I could have made em skip. I am old now. 
and these vile crosses spoil me out of breath fie oh quite out of breath and spent bring in old kent and edgar guide you hither your father whom you said was near exit edgar he may be an ear witness at the least of our proceedings kent brought in here who are you my eyes are none of the best i'll tell you straight oh albany well sir we are your captives and you are come to see death pass upon us why this delay or is it your highness pleasure to give us first the torture say ye so why here's old kent and i as tough a pair as e'er bore tyrant's stroke but my cordelia my poor cordelia here o oh, pity take off their chains thou injured majesty the wheel of fortune now has made her circle, And blessings yet stand twixt thy grave and thee. Comest thou, inhumane lord, To soothe us back to a fool's paradise of hope, To make our doom more wretched? Go to, we are too well acquainted with misfortune To be gulled with lying hope. No, we will hope no more. I have a tale to unfold so full of wonder as cannot meet an easy faith. But by that royal injured head, tis true. What would your highness? Know the noble Edgar impeached Lord Edmund since the fight of treason, and dared him for the proof to single combat, in which the gods confirmed his charge by conquest. I left e'en now the traitor wounded mortally. And whither tends this story? Ere they fought, Lord Edgar gave into my hands this paper, a blacker scrawl of treason and of lust than can be found in the records of hell. There, sacred sir, behold the character of Goneril, the worst of daughters, but more vicious wife. Could there be yet addition to their guilt? What will not they that wrong a father do? Since then my injuries, Lear, fall in with thine. I have resolved the same redress for both. What says my lord? Speak, for me thought I heard the charming voice of a descending god. The troops by Edmund raised I have disbanded. Those that remain are under my command. What comfort may be brought to cheer your age and heal your savage wrongs shall be applied for to your majesty we do resign your kingdom save what part yourself conferred on us in marriage hear you that my liege then there are gods and virtue is their care is't possible let the spheres stop their course the sun make halt the winds be hushed the seas and fountains rest all nature pause and listen to the change where is my kent my cages here, my liege. Why, I have news that will recall thy youth. Ha! Didst thou hear it? Or did the inspiring gods whisper to me alone? Old Lear shall be a king again. The prince that like a god has power has said it. Cordelia then shall be a queen. Mark that. Cordelia shall be queen. Winds, catch the sound and bear it on your rosy wings to heaven cordelia is a queen re-enter edgar with gloucester look sir where pious edgar comes leading his eyeless father o oh, my liege his wondrous story will deserve your leisure what he has done and suffered for your sake what for the fair cordelia's where is my liege conduct me to his knees to hail his second birth of empire my dear edgar has with himself revealed the king's blessed restoration my poor dark gloucester oh let me kiss that once more sceptred hand hold thou mistakest the majesty kneel here Cordelia has our power, Cordelia's queen. Speak, is not that the noble suffering Edgar? My 
pious son more dear than my lost eyes i wronged him too but here's the fair amends your leave my liege for an unwelcome message edmund but that's a trifle is expired what more will touch you your imperious daughters goneril and haughty regan both are dead each by the other poisoned at a banquet this dying they confessed o fatal period of ill-governed life ingrateful as they were my heart feels yet a pang of nature for their wretched fall but edgar i defer thy joys too long thou serv'st distressed cordelia take her crowned the imperial grace fresh blooming on her brow nay gloucester thou hast here a father's right thy helping hand to heap blessings on their head old kent throws in his hearty wishes too the gods and you too largely recompense what i have done the gift strikes merit dumb nor do i blush to own myself overpaid for all my sufferings past now gentle gods give gloucester his discharge no gloucester thou hast business yet for life thou kent and i retired to some cool cell will gently pass our short reserves of time in calm reflections on our fortunes past cheered with the relation of the prosperous reign of this celestial pair thus our remains shall in an even course of thought be passed enjoy the present hour nor fear the last our drooping country now erects her head peace spreads her balmy wings and plenty blooms divine cordelia all the gods can witness how much thy love to empire i prefer thy bright example shall convince the world whatever storms of fortune are decreed that truth and virtue shall at last succeed exeunt omnes finis epilogue <sighs> inconstancy the reigning sin of the age will scarce endure true lovers on the stage you hardly even in plays with such dispense and poets kill em in their own defence yet one bold proof i was resolved to give that i could three hours constancy outlive you fear perhaps whilst on the stage we are made such saints we shall indeed take up the trade sometimes we threaten <laughs> but our virtue <laughs> may for truth i fear with your pit valour weigh for not to flatter either i much doubt when we are off the stage and you are out we are not quite so coy nor you so stout we talk of nunneries but to be sincere whoever lives to see us cloistered there may hope to meet our critics at tangier for shame give over this inglorious trade of worrying poets and go maul the alcade <laughs> well since you're all for blustering in the pit this play's reviver humbly does admit your absolute power to damn his part of it but still so many master touches shine of that vast hand that first laid this design that in great shakespeare's right he's bold to say if you like nothing you have seen to-day the play your judgment damns not you the play end of act five end of the history of king lear by naam tate